Hello. Uh, good evening, everyone. Um, so I think Sam uh, has given a very good talk on designing because personally, I suck at UI design. <laughs> so I was completely blown away. Thanks, Sam, for sharing. Uh, today, I'm going to talk about like just share five random Ruby tips. And um, in case you're wondering who I am, uh, my name is Shen Law, and that's my Twitter handler, code underscore SSL. Uh, I actually work for IDA, but I don't have the opportunity to work at this office. It's very nice. I'm actually seconded to Ministry of Manpower uh, to work on an HR project. So um, I, my first tip is tip number zero, not because like normally people say you know programmer starts from zero, but because I actually have other like five other tips. This is just something extra that I wanna highlight. So I'm using this tool called Rabbit, which is a Ruby gem. So what is Rabbit? Rabbit is actually a presentation tool for Rubyists, and you can write your slides in RD, Markdown, or Hiki. Um, personally, I use Markdown, so I can write my slides in Vim. Ah, so. <laughs> Uh, and I can run, I can launch my slide using Rake. How cool is that? Um, and there are many themes. This is actually a default theme. Um, and you can find out more from the website rabbit shocker.org. And um, how did I come to know this tool? It's, you know, at Rap.Ruby conference this year, Matt Zach was the uh, keynote speaker. And he used this tool. And I was like, wow, it's actually quite interesting because there is a tortoise and rabbit underneath there. And the tortoise is actually um, the, the time that you allocate for this talk. So I actually allocated like 15 minutes. And rabbit is actually the actual progress, like how far have you come to this uh, presentation. Yeah, it's a very cute uh, picture on um, duck typing. So tip number one, I, I guess Ruby is, we are very familiar with immunerables. Like we use a lot of methods like select, reject, um, reduce, um, yeah, etc. Um, what I want to share today is something less commonly used. So number one is take while. So what it does, um, so the documentation says that uh, passes elements to a block until the block returns new or false, then stops iterating and return an array of all prior elements. Uh, we are programmers, so we, it's easier for us to read the code and understand what it does. So there is an array, one, two, three, four, five, zero, and we just call dot take while and it passes in a block that says, um, i less than 3. So what it does is it iterate over all the elements until it reaches an element that actually uh, fulfills, sorry, returns nil or falls from that block. Then it will just stop and then return all the prior elements. So this is actually returning 1 and 2. Um, likewise, there is a counterpart called drop while, which is quite similar, but it actually drops the elements until it reaches an element that for which the block actually returns new or false, and then you just return uh, the remaining elements. And tips number two, um, active record validation context. So, like, we, how, how many of you actually use Rails? Like, okay, so quite, so I'm sure you guys are familiar with active record. So normally we have a lot of rules in our active record models. Um, but the thing is that sometimes um, rules may be applicable um, at a certain stage of an application flow. So normally what we do is that we can pass in an if or unless um, option to specify whether, um, right, when should a rule be applicable. But I learned that there is actually an option called on, whereby you can specify the context or an array of contexts um, to allow to specify when the validation rule should be applicable. So this is an example. So you, as you can see, the username and password are actually less than eight characters. But when I call dot valid question mark, you actually return true because in the previous slide I specified that those validation rules are actually on context one, and the second one should be um, effective on these two contexts, context one and two. So. If you don't specify context, then you say, okay, it's valid. But you can actually pass in like, oh, um, context one. Then you will say that, oh, actually both username and password are not valid. And you can pass in like, yeah, context two, then you will say password is not valid. Um, this is very useful. So for example, you can instantiate a form and then maybe you want to save draft, but at that point of time when you save the draft, you may not want to have the full validation rules to be, um, to be invoked. 
So you may want to only have a subset of it. So you might want to define different contexts. Yeah, in my opinion, it's cleaner than conditional validation, but it really depends on what you want to do. And another advantage is the client code can decide what context to be passed in. So it's easier for the client code to, 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 to decide you know, what rules I want to, um, um, to use. Tips number three, active support. So if you know active record, I hope you know what active support is. Um, it actually provides a lot of useful methods. And for active record, uh, we can actually use delegate, which is, well, a, a macro, a method that allows you to delegate function call to an associated uh, object or model. So in this case, like a person is a, a, a person belongs to a household. Yeah. So normally what, if you want to retrieve information from the household of that person, you probably have to do person.household.information. But by using delegation, I can just call person.information and this will actually delegate a method call to the information object that this household, sorry, delegate to the household object that this person is associated with. Um, of course, person dot information sounds very strange, right? Because what I want is really household information. Uh, it turns out that there is an option called prefix. So if you set it true, by default, it will use the model name, oh, sorry, the, the, the name of that symbol that you are, you're delegating to as the prefix. So I can call dot household underscore information, which makes more sense. Um, if you want to have something more custom, you don't call household, you'll call something else, then you can specify a different string, then you can have a different prefix. Um, of course, to make it more robust in the event where the associated object that you're delegating to is not available, you don't want the program to crash, then you can specify allow nil to be true. Then it will just return nil. Um, I mean, this can be good and bad depending on what you want to achieve. Um, tips number four is on bundle install. Um, so, you know, like we use bundler to configure the gems that you want to use. And sometimes you are deploying to an environment that is so secure that you don't have outgoing internet connectivity. Yeah. So when that happens, when you try to run bundle install, then you encounter a problem because you cannot fetch Ruby gems from, you know, the rubygems.org. So what normally we will do <laughs> is we will run bundle package dash dash all, and this will actually package up all the gems and put it in your vendor folder. So remember there is a vendor folder in your Rails app. You might have not discerned it, but it's there. <laughs> so yeah. And you can actually check in, like push this code to your repository, and then when you push it to production, uh, you can just run bundle install dash dash local, then you won't connect to the internet, you will just install whatever gems that you have in that vendor folder. And what are the advantages of doing so? Yeah, you can install gems offline, and yeah, it's certainly fast because you don't have to download anything. And another advantage is there is no need to host custom gems on a server. So, like for example, if you have multiple Rails applications, it's very likely that you will create a custom gem to share your Ruby code across different projects. And when that happens, I mean, generally you would actually host your custom gems on a gem server. But this is a very uh, quick and dirty way. You just have to, you know, um, put a gem file into your project and then you just run bundle install. Um, tips number five is parallel tests. So, how many of you write tests? Uh, can I have a show hand? Ah, very good. <laughs> so in our project, we write a lot of yeah, unit tests as well as functional tests. And sometimes um, it, it might take a while to run. So we actually use this gem called parallel tests. And what it allows us to do is that we can run our tests in parallel. We actually split all the tests uh, and then allocate to different processes. And then you just use different CPU calls to run the tests. And the website actually says that if you have two CPUs, you have two X testing speed. But in my experience, it's not always true. There are a lot of other factors. And it works for RSpec, test unit, and Cucumber. So it's not just for unit tests. If you write a lot of Cucumber tests, you know that Cucumber tests can run quite slowly. So you may want to use this to spit out things a little bit. Um, so that is the GitHub link if you want to find out more. Personally, I, well, I can't show you what I'm looking on, but I created a contrived uh, example so you can find out from my GitHub account. I'll share this slide later on. But 
I created a Rails app that has got over 15k um, aspect examples uh, by using a very simple uh, sim link. Like I create 1,000 sim links to link to the same uh, aspect file. Yeah, and then when I run aspect in serial, it took me like one minute and 40 seconds. But when I use this gem and run in parallel, well, this MacBook Air it has got only two logical CPUs, but it has got four logic, sorry, two physical CPU, but it has got four logical CPUs. So by default, it checks your logic number of logical CPUs and then just um, run the test in four parallel processes. And it took me like one minute. So it's effectively like 40% reduction in test time. So if you have a more powerful machine, maybe you use a MacBook Pro with uh, eight cores, then perhaps you will cut down the test time even further. And that is the, yeah, the repo if you're interested in. So at this very special venue, you know, Sand Crawler, and I feel that the force is very strong in you guys. And I, yeah, thank you very much for listening to my talk. <laughs> Any question? Yeah. Yes. Selenium, I'm not entirely sure. Uh, maybe not, because it says cucumber uh, aspect and test unit. But there may be other equivalent gem out there that you can use. Yeah, but not, not that I know of. Yeah. Any other question? Dun, dun. <laughs> if not, then yeah, thank you very much. <laughs>